ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, that is the first session on the hospitality uh, day dedicated to the hospitality subjects. Uh, I am so glad and I'm so happy for this kind of the team. Ivana is the conductor. And let's to start, don't, don't waste the time, okay? Uh, uh, now is uh, one presentation from Ivan. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here again to open Hospitality Day. Um, my name is Ivan Aneshkovic, and I'm Director of Sales and Client Services in STR. Um, I would like to welcome all of you and to welcome my panelists. Uh, I will introduce them uh, in a minute, but to start with, I would like to um, take you through hotel performance trends in Europe. So I work for STR, which is a co-star company, and we are leaders in hospitality and commercial real estate analytics. We have access to a data of 77,000 hotels worldwide. And there is a little disclaimer here. Of course, the data we display is based on what we have in our system, and it's not, um, shouldn't be taken for granted. Of course, the data keeps changing, it keeps fluctuating. But what I will try to answer in the next 10 minutes and to give an introduction to the panel will be in, in, in line of, will the international demand fully return? Should you invest in hotels? And what do pipeline and forecast data tell us? Looking at the inbound uh, demand to Europe, so at the beginning of 2023, it was the time of political and economical uncertainty. But we see that um, forecasts tell us that by the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, demand in Europe will reach pre-pandemic levels. There are a few things that are important to consider when we talk about recovery of demand. One is China travelers are coming back, and this will have impact on both global and European demand. China has been for a very long time under a strict lockdown, and they're a big source market for a number of different um, regions in Europe and internationally. The expectation is that they will fully be back towards the end of 2023 and more in 2024. So this is one aspect that will have impact on demand recovery. Second is Americans. So this year we call them now dollarized travelers. Uh, US dollar has been very strong. The exchange rate has been very favorable for uh, Americans. And they have been, um, if you traveled around Europe this, uh, this year and last summer especially, you could see a lot of Americans around. So they will still uh, be a strong source of demand for Europe and they will uh, contribute significantly to recovery of demand. Some destinations, of course, have a higher percentage of American demand, but um, they are also quite present in some of the regional countries. Another aspect to think about is that corporate, corporate travel, we do see some signs of recovery of corporate travel. And um, most of the data you will see today is looking at uh, comparing today to 2019. So index how we are on that recovery pace, because 2019 was pretty much strongest year for most of the destinations. So we see some uh, recovery in weekday demand, which usually indicates that corporate travel is coming back. It's still negative comparing to 2019, but we see that the drops are smaller. What we've noticed also, um, looking at the data from April to June, is that it looks like that the group demand is coming back to some extent. So again, nowhere near 2019, but in the period of um, end of April, beginning of May, during holiday season in Europe, we did see some traction of group demand. All this at a very, very high price. So um, we can see, we started looking at ADR, um, from nominal and real perspective because of the huge inflation that um, Europe and many countries in Europe have been experiencing. But looking at real ADR, not only nominal affected by inflation, we see that ADR keeps growing um, and the recession busting rates prevail across different destinations in Europe. And this is not only exclusive to luxury class anymore. So it's known already that in the last few months, few years, it's the luxury who have, has been lifting rates significantly. And even though they have been losing to some extent on occupancy, they really managed um, their performance based on ADR growth. 
we see now that the rate growth is not only a luxury story, but all the different classes of hotels are growing rates and uh, consumers are paying for it because the rate is, rates keep going up in real terms as well. So with this in mind, um, this is more a, a philosophical question rather than uh, me giving an answer, but maybe my panelists will be able to comment on this better. What we see is that uh, this is Q1 data, looking in, in um, nominal terms and in real terms, profitability of hotels is almost back to 2019 levels. And the winter was tough. Politically, economically, the demand was down, the consumers were price sensitive due to insecurity and also uh, costs increasing in all different aspects of their life. But we see that after a tough winter, RevPAR is springing forward with an upward tendency and both ADR and occupancy, occupancies are on the growth. Uh, sorry. Um, as part of Costar now, we do have access to additional commercial real estate data. And based on what we have observed so far, hotels are proving more resilient than other commercial real estate. And this is really mainly due to ability of hotels to manage their profit by fluctuating ADR. So their rev per square feet is more stable and more manageable to uh, fluctuate than it would be in any other commercial real estate asset. So from that perspective, also hotels do sound like a good idea. They're in better position to weather the storm like the one we had behind us. There are specific hotel types, and again, something we will discuss more in a panel, that really outperformed across the world in different regions. Resorts have been, um, in 2022, really reaping the rewards of pent-up demand and everyone willing to travel and um, really increased leisure, leisure travelers. Regional and secondary cities, driven by domestic demand, again, had a very, very good uh, recovery pace. Gateway cities, which is typically capital cities of the, of the countries that were mainly corporate um, in the past, have been the, the least on the recovery pace, but they will be driving the recovery this year. Of course, not all countries are equal. This is looking at the Q1 data, and uh, all the numbers you will see in the next few slides are indexed to 2019. So showing how far, if it's above 100, we are further ahead from 2019, and if it's behind, um, 100, we are still away from 2019 levels. And we can see here clearly that in Q1, the nearest region here has really surpassed the rest of Europe. So there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and some countries that have been really lagged behind, DAH and Benelux, with a really low domestic demand, um, corporate not returning fully. Uh, and then for the summer destinations and resorts, we looked at summer 2022 versus summer 2019. It's uh, across the board, resorts has outperformed 2019. Gateway cities um, are mirroring the national trend. So we see uh, in terms of occupancy, very few cities got back to 2019 levels. Um, Belgrade being one of them. And Belgrade was one of the destinations that got back to 2019 levels in terms of occupancy among the first. Um, and if we look at data until May, European average was 90, index 95. However, from April onwards, all the destinations are picking up in terms of occupancy. But just looking at Belgrade here from the occupancy perspective running 28, it really was well ahead um, of other European destinations. Of course, it's important always to consider that some of these destinations are coming from a higher base, but the recovery of, of Belgrade was um, significantly quicker than the rest. And there are multiple reasons, but we can discuss some of them on the panel as well. In terms of ADR, it's pretty much across the board. All the destinations have driven their rates well above 2019 levels, specifically cities that have a high percentage of luxury portfolios, like Paris with uh, 150 uh, index or Budapest with 163. Belgrade, again, quite strong in terms of rate growth. And then, as I said, looking at running 28 days, um, the rates are pretty uh, anonymously, unanimously in all countries above 2019 levels. Um, just quickly looking at the region, um, at the capital cities in Balkans that we report on. So um, occupancy, ADR, 
and RevPars. Belgrade, again, the, the city that both occupancy and ADR have gone up May year to date. Podgorica, Zagreb, um, slight declines in occupancy, Ljubljana slightly more, and then rates are up in uh, Podgorica and Zagreb while Ljubljana is behind. Um, I just wanted to bring this up here again in, in light of the following discussion, but also rate increases. The inflation still remains strong. It dropped comparing to the previous month, but Serbia definitely leading Euro in, in the group of regional countries with inflation of 14.8. Um, so again, something important to consider when we talk about the investment, but also performance um, in the region. What to expect? Um, we also collect business on the books data. We don't have that available for all destinations, but this shows number of already confirmed bookings. Um, and we look at number of confirmed bookings this year versus last year. So pretty much in most of the destinations in Europe, business on the books are higher and ahead of previous year. Um, similar goes to regional markets, not only capital cities and resorts are still um, set to outperform 2022. So they will continue growing and most of the resort markets where we do report business on the books data are well ahead uh, in terms of confirmed bookings already. In terms of the longer term forecast, um, year, we do forecast for around 30 different markets in Europe and we anticipate that by year end, most of those markets will recover to 2019 levels. And long-term outlook also remains robust. So ADR will keep uh, being in a positive, just stabilizing the growth. Demand will stabilize, occupancy will keep um, having an upward trend, but it's fully due to recover on a European level in combination of different cities that we report around 2025. Looking at then the pipeline, so during pandemic, four to five percent of hotels in Europe have closed. Um, and now we see the hotels, uh, and during pandemic, of course, the hotels were opening, but a lot of projects were delayed. Um, and we do see now the pipeline and construction picking up. So by the end of 2023, we anticipate that Europe will have around 75,000 rooms extra. And then on average per year in the next three years, around 67,000 rooms. Considering European pipeline, similar destinations that were heading the, the pipeline leader, leaderboard still remain the same. UK and Germany, followed by the Spain, are the biggest um, pipeline markets in Europe. If we look then at the region, so I plotted it on the map so we can see that it's spread out. There are around, and again, this is the data that we have, there are around 16,000 rooms that are in construction or final planning across Balkan region, the countries that are covered here, and around extra 10,000 planned. More than half of them are franchised, and large portion of them are again in the coastal or regional um, areas, not that many in the main capital cities, as we can see here distributed on the map. One more thing uh, to mention with the pipeline is that the number of conversions has significantly increased. The authority started from 2019. So uh, in terms of division between uh, investments that are starting from scratch and conversions, conversions are really taking more uh, precedence. And this is, again, something that we can talk a bit more with our true experts here. Um, looking at actual number of hotels in supply and those that are in pipeline uh, and what percentage of new supply will enter the market. Greece has the biggest pipeline at the moment, but in terms of impact on their existing supply, this is around 3% of increase in supply. Montenegro doesn't have that big pipeline in terms of number of rooms, but considering the existing supply, they will increase their supply at around 30, 32%. Of course, the biggest percentage increase is Albania, which was quite undeveloped market. Um, and it's um, one of the markets that still has the biggest pipeline in the region with Croatia being ahead, uh, excluding Greece and Romania, which are bigger, bigger markets um, with the different dynamics and more mature. Um, and just to wrap up before we move to the panel. So to summarize, uh, we have some supply growth in Europe, the uh, region is slightly ahead in terms of percentage growth in the future. Uh, recession is looming around us, but in terms of hospitality, 
uh, recovering business and group demand, resilient leisure travel, stronger occupancy on the books would help hotels weather uh, this storm as well, and it's uh, expected to be a strong year for most of the hotels. Uh, and rate growth remains real. So inflation is there, but the rates um, are growing at a faster pace than in inflation. Gateway cities will continue strong recovery. Resorts will have another record year, um, and rest of the markets are closing up on luxury. From the investment perspective, just a few points um, before we move to the panel. So with challenge always comes opportunity, and there are a few different challenges that um, investment industry is facing from interest rates to recession to huge rise of costs and then maturation of existing loans. But then on the other hand, the hotel performance is healthy. There is a lot of available capital awaiting for investment um, and there are a number of distressed assets uh, waiting to be invested. So um, I will leave some time at the end for the questions for myself or everyone else, but I would like to move now to uh, my panelists and to introduce them. So, uh -huh. we have one step. Can you hear me okay? I think it's fine. Perfect. So, uh, welcome once again. Um, starting with the ladies, so representing ladies and Eurostar Hotels, Sandra Calvo Tardajos. Uh, Hotel Investment and Development Manager at Eurostar Hotels, Hotuza Group. Welcome, Sandra. Nice to have you at the panel and in Belgrade as well. Um, then we have uh, Nicolas Dimopoulos, Development Manager, Greece, Italy, and Cyprus from Wyndham Hotels and Resorts. And last but not the least, and I think uh, needs little to no introduction, is <laughs> Jivar Advasic, co owner of Cadena Properties, Cadena Sotheby in International Realty and Director of Development for the Balkans. So thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I know that not all of us are very comfortable and experienced in this situation, but this is going to be the conversation um, following the presentation I did, but also sharing your experience with working in the region um, or trying to work with the region. And maybe just to, to open up, um, I would like to give a space immediate to, to you guys because you are experts in this and maybe starting with uh, Mr. Vasic, who is really someone who has been present in the market for a very long time, um, who is also involved in different assets, so maybe commenting on um, sustainability of hotel, hotel investment asset versus uh, other different uh, commercial real estates, and then your experience in the region and how did it change in the last few years. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I think I'm loud enough and the sun is, I didn't bring sunglasses, but if, if I'm sweating, it's not because I'm really, really worried, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here again. Um, I kind of decided, I think it's interesting, I kind of decided to, to change my life year and a half ago and moved out from operations, move into the real estate, but then uh, the hotels kind of did not want to let me go, so I took... Uh, role and stayed with Intercontinental Hotel Group uh, as a director of development for this, of, for this region while uh, doing my, my real estate business. And that's kind of why you see me uh, wearing two hats. Um, I, I, I think the biggest change for me uh, after COVID, we went through some difficult times. And I think uh, the owners of the hotels that, that uh, graciously were were giving the investments, realized that the standalone hotels uh, will be very difficult to sustain. And so all the projects that you see now, at least the ones that we're dealing uh, in the Balkans, they are not standalone hotels. It's, uh, uh, it's basically real estate, some kind of apartments, uh, they're either going back to the rental pool uh, or it's a residential apartments that they're selling and then moving back to the one of the franchisees and, and Nicolas, I'm sure, knows what I'm talking about. So I, I think IEG done a smart thing and they developed kind of residential uh, department for the hotels. And, and I see that this is a new thing to do. And, and I think that we're gonna see that more and more. Uh, I think what's gonna happen is that if we want to continue with the pipeline that you were talking about, and if we wanna see hotels grow, um, 
the, the management companies, and I'm talking about all the IEGs, Hiltons, uh, Sheratons of, of this world, uh, Accor and, and others, uh, will have to learn how to deal with investors that want the franchise property uh, and they want to develop residential units that will be um, more lenient toward what owners want. Um, it's a huge difference in, in, in the Balkans between the standalone hotels and uh, residential mix. Uh, we see that owners are getting much bigger return on investment uh, this way and what they're doing obviously because the interest rates became so high um, you are kind of selling the apartment and using that money to to create the hotel. Uh, one interesting slide that you had was about Montenegro. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in the region but most of my time uh, not by choice I spend in Montenegro and I have to say uh, they're missing two things. They're missing infrastructure and they're missing airports. So I think if, if Podgorica and Tivat would change their course with the airports the way we have done that, we, I, I think Belgrade has done a fantastic job. I think when you, when you look at uh, Belgrade Airport, the reason why you see the ADR in Belgrade hotels going finally where where we want them to be, uh, one of the biggest reasons is, is Air Serbia and, uh, and the airport. When you go to Montenegro, you're missing infrastructure. So you have a lot of beautiful hotels. Uh, we just signed as IAG five deals uh, in Montenegro for Intercontinental, for two Crown Plazas in Budva and Kolashin for Vignette Collection in Podgorica and for Holiday Inn Express in Mojkovac. But, but what, what the problem becomes in Montenegro is really how to get from point A to point B and it's such a small country. So during the summer when the season starts, uh, you land to Tivat and if you're driving to, to Budva it takes you hour, hour and 15 minutes and we're talking about 25 kilometers. Another thing that, 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 that I want to, to, to say and, and this is where I would close now uh, I was fortunate enough to, to drive from Montenegro to Sarajevo because we we're signing there another deal. Uh, and, and again, it's not going to be a standalone hotel. Um, 170 kilometers of the road, uh, five hours drive uh, from Podgorica to Sarajevo. Uh, and I took all these international people and all these vice presidents of, of, of big international companies um, and, and, and this is something that the Balkans is lacking. So, so if we want better ADRs, if we want more projects, if we want this pipeline to change, uh, we have to change the infrastructure in the Balkans. If that doesn't happen, um, we're going to have a very difficult time at one point separating ourselves and we're going to remain where we are comparing to uh, the rest of the Europe. Thank you. This was really great and it's really great introduction because just before we started um, the panel I had a conversation with Nicolas who is currently working more on developing Greece but he's trying to uh, do some development in the region and these were some of the things that he pointed out as the challenges in the region. But maybe as someone who is working in a market that's maybe in this development phase ahead, we saw that Greece has a really big supply in place, really big pipeline. Maybe if you share with um, us your experience in working in more mature market and then what obstacles do you have as you're trying to, um, to work here? And then just for the benefit of the audience, Wyndham really is also one of the um, companies that does have quite um, I don't want to say aggressive, but ambitious strategy in terms of uh, European expansion through various different acquisitions of European brands. So maybe if you can just comment from your perspective. Okay. Thank you very much, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. I totally agree with what's been said so far, that the biggest challenge that this region is facing is connectivity. Uh, seasonality is another issue we have, and infrastructure. So you can build the best hotel, the best product in the world. This makes no difference if you can get people to come in. So for that, Greece is a little bit one step ahead on the curve. We're not there yet, we still have many things to do, but things are getting better. 
For example, in the last couple of years, we have many direct flights from the U.S., so that has helped a lot the incoming tourism from uh, U.S., which, as you said, have high spenders and they improve the quality of the product. And on the back of that, we're improving right now the product we have there. We have more upscale products, five-star products, so we have many conversion towards that uh, region. Uh, so, unless that happens, as what I said, the Balkans are going to have a big issue on that. So, they have to invest. Private investment has to go hand in hand with public investment. So, countries, governments have to invest on infrastructure and connectivity. So, the local airlines. For Greece, Aegean right now is supporting that uh, trend and it has direct flights from sec for secondary cities as well, not just Athens, like Thessaloniki. So, it connects Thessaloniki with many major cities around Europe. So it can create the city destination and expand the season further out of the summer. We need the southern months, we need the winter. So this is the way forward. Now, having said that, although Greece is one step ahead, right now the robust recovery we have seen in the last couple of years in development in Greece is losing steam right now. And that's because new investors that are coming in are not finding value anymore in Greece. Although you have lots of interest for Greece, there's nothing to do. There's a lot of snooping around, looking, doing the due diligence, but nothing is closing. And existing owners and uh, investors already in the market are facing difficulties to expand further because they worry about the current political and economic uh, situation. So first of all, with the increased interest rate, they have to assess and see how this interest rate increase will affect their operational cash flows. They have to re-adjust the strategies, both financially and operationally. Financially, they have to maybe do restructuring of the debt with banks. They have to opt for fixed uh, terms. And operationally, first of all, they have to tap the cost base. They have to try to reduce cost as much as possible. Because so far, what they were doing, they were increasing ADRs. And we've seen that increase so far. We have another record year increase right now, but occupancies are lower. The rev parts are above uh, 2019 because of the increased ADR, but this can go for way too long. We have to stop passing our cost to the client, so we have to decrease our cost base. Uh, more of that, the operators have to assess the capital expenditure. I think more has to invest in this region to upgrade the skill set of our employees and also invest in technology, something that will increase our operational agility and will uh, also increase the margins. So this has to be done. Now, for Wyndham, uh, as you said, we're quite aggressive in the last five years. Since we became public in 2018, we have expanded a lot through acquisitions. Uh, we have this strategy. We were mainly U.S. company. So we have this strategy to become international and by doing that through development and growth. So for the last five years, we almost bought a brand every 18 months. Right now, we have 24 brands in every segment from economy up to upper upscale. So we have a brand that's suitable for any client, any product, and uh, we try to develop all of our brands, not just one or two. We try to fit the best brand for the client, the building, and the, and the area. So, Wyndham will continue to expand. Wyndham is there to look at the uh, new deals, but we're not, do, as our president say, we're not doing a deal just for the sake of doing a deal. We're doing deals that make sense to us, that increase our EBITDA, that they are complementary to what we already have and to areas that we want to expand. Lately, we bought, the last acquisition we made was uh, Vienna House, which is a four-star lifestyle brand in Europe, which was a statement mostly from a U.S. board that they believe in Europe, that we believe in the segment, and we want to expand uh, internationally. And uh, because of that strategy, uh, lately 60% of our pipeline, although in the past it was from the U.S., now it's mainly international. Are you looking at anything in the region, specifically more narrow region? Like in the region right now, we have started with Montenegro as well. We already have a hotel there, and we have mm -hmm. two more on the pipeline right now. Uh, I'm seriously trying to expand Serbia, Albania, but Albania is a bit difficult at the moment. There's many things to be done in Albania before it becomes a mature market that attracts the investor uh, there. 
of course, I also believe that very soon you're going to have uh, interest from investors, let's say from Greece, that already been in the market for the last five, ten years, already have invested, and they're looking for a way out. This investor, they want to find value towards Balkans. So I see an interest from my side of the world to you, towards the Balkans coming in. Um, I would like to now come back to you quickly. So your company has doubled, doubled, I think, in the last nine nine years, and most of the supply Eurostars have is in Spain. In the in the region, I know that you acquired a few hotels in Slovenia, one in Bulgaria. Uh, what's new from Eurostars? Are you um, are you looking more in the region? I know you told me something has happened a few days ago, so maybe you can share with the audience and then just let us know, just in general. What's your view on what we've heard from, from Givara de Nicolas? Um, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, actually, in Eurostars, we are quite new in the region, in the Balkan region. Uh, as you said, we duplicated our portfolio in eight years. Uh, now we have uh, 251 hotels, uh, but 170 are in, in Spain, indeed. We are a Spanish company. And uh, recently, uh, we started in Ljubljana, in Slovenia, with three hotels two years ago. Uh, where we have one hotel in Sofia, in Bulgaria, and we have one hotel under construction here in Belgrade. And recently, we signed an agreement uh, for Queen of Montenegro uh, two weeks ago. So we plan to open this, uh, this hotel in, in two weeks or three weeks. Um, yeah, but I totally agree with uh, Nicolas and uh, Siborat that um, it's quite difficult uh, to enter in the market, especially in, in Montenegro. The infrastructures are not uh, as far as uh, we, we expected. Even uh, when we try to open the hotel, the labor, the, I mean, it's not an easy, an easy thing to, to do, but uh, yeah, I think uh, this destination has a lot of potential. It's the same as all southeastern Europe. Um, well, actually, the best uh, example is for me. For example, uh, coming here on Sunday from Madrid, I have to do like I had to do like um, uh, in France uh, with Air France because there is no direct flight even to Belgrade, which is a very important capital, European capital, uh, with three hours of delay. So I mean. Um, of course, Belgrade is uh, much prepared than the rest of, uh, uh, for example, Montenegro or Albania, as you said, Nicola. Uh, but uh, still, uh, there are a lot of things to do. Uh, but yes, I think there are a lot of potential. And um, a good important thing that I saw in your, in your presentation was about the Asian market. Um, I was before like nine years in charge of this market. And that's the reason I think that uh, they are recovering. Uh, they have been like three years without traveling. And it was a really good, important source market in all the, um, all the European destinations. So I'm sure that uh, they are coming back. The, this market is increasing. And I hope uh, that, uh, for example, that we cannot have, uh, well, in Greece or in Belgrade, we can have some Russian market, but not in Spain, for example. So I hope this Asian market can fill the, the black, the, the gap that we have from, uh, from other markets. So let's see, yeah. So I think uh, both of you mentioned, like for example, from Givera perspective and maybe from mine, Belgrade is a bit better, much better connected at some of the destinations, but then you still feel that there is improvement to be done. And I agree, but a lot has been done in the last few years. and. Uh, Everything is constant. I had two friends here two weeks ago, and the first two words they learned was Radu Yutoku, which is work in progress. Mm -hmm. So they said their impression is that everything is work in progress here, that so there is so much going on, starting with the airport that is work in progress for a while. Uh, but something maybe I wanted to, um, to mention to Jivarat. So we are mentioning that infrastructure is not that great, but then what I've seen that in Serbia, there are more branded hotels popping up in the secondary cities like Subotica, Bece. Um, what do you think about that? This is, this wasn't, it has been probably about the time that the brands start entering other, other markets. Um, but is this the, what's, what's your view on that? First of all, Sandra, congratulations on uh, Queens of Montenegro. Is that, a, is that a lease deal? Yes. So you guys go into the, 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 the lease deals? Yes. 
we were looking into that, and uh, actually, I like that property a lot. That was uh, Falkensteiner once upon a time. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, but it, I, I think for audience, it's good to know that that you guys do the the, the lease deals because quite to to help you in this market, um, guys like us, it's it's more corporate, and owners look at us a bit differently. You know, you, you we have to. I mean, I, I think IEG has changed quite a lot here, and that's the reason why we sign so many deals like Subotica and Kragujevac and so forth, because uh, the corporate life, unfortunately, has a very rigid way of doing things that does not appear to people from, from the Balkans. So, so I think for you to enter this market and get to know these people, it's good for them to know that you're doing the lease deals, because that can help you grow. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, but um, to answer your question, I, I think what is important for me to say, and I, I don't like to, to, to go into politics, but I just want to make sure that, that I'm very clear there. I, I, I think uh, the Balkans, when I was talking about the infrastructure uh, and talking about the roads, um, we have done so many deals in Slovenia they have amazing roads. Um, with Albania, I, I kind of disagree because we signed Crown Plaza Dures, Intercontinental Tirana, and Crown Plaza Flora. Um, and I think Al Albania is going to be the thing. Um, and, and whoever from the operator gets their food there first, I think will have a huge advantage. Um, Albania is, is developing quite a lot. Uh, the new airports, there is a lot of U.S. money coming there. Um, and the roads, the infrastructure there is getting better and better. Uh, there are challenges, um, but, but, but the new roads that are being built are, 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 are doing a good thing. Uh, Montenegro needs help and, and Bosnia needs help. I think when you look at the Ser Serbia and the roads, I think the, the, the government in the past four or five years has done a great job. Uh, and, and, and I think when you look at accessibility from, for example, how you get to Zlatibor now and how you were getting to Zlatibor before, it, it, it's a huge difference. I think from, from what I learned uh, in past year and a half, my, my life, and I think it's always good to talk from the experience, my life has changed quite a lot in past 18 months. Um, and I sometimes ask myself what I was doing 25 years in a pure, uh, hotel industry, because when you look at the other part of the real estate, uh, especially residential, uh, but also commercial, um, it's it's really much easier to make money. Uh, the hoteliers, um, they, they 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 have a very difficult job, and the owners that are investing, they are putting quite a lot of money with the return investment that is very slow. I think that the hotels are a great investment to do uh, when you have hotel in the uh, market that operates 12 months a year and that has a good ADR. Um, when I used to consider myself as, a, as a, one of the good GMs here in Belgrade and, and I used to oversee nine hotels for IEG from, from Ljubljana, Sofia, Porto Montenegro, Regent and so forth. You know, when, when you think about the Rev Par and how the Rev Par, we were growing here in Belgrade Rev Par by uh, increasing the occupancy and lowering the rates. Uh, and I was not a very loved GM for, for that experience because I used to run the hotel that has 420 rooms. And my strategy would be really to lower the rate but fill in the hotel. Uh, and we've done that successfully. You know, the numbers would multiply. But what was the problem? The problem was that then you waste more electricity, you waste more food, you waste uh, uh, more shampoos and conditioners and so forth. And the amortization of the hotel becomes that you have to invest more often, right? So now Belgrade kind of after COVID changed the course. And now you have a high rate, but if you compare the hotels and you look at the the STR report, the occupancies are there, but no one is, you know, peak sold out. It's kind of, you're running great occupancy 
for the long period of time with a high ADR, and your REVPAR again is growing, but with a completely different strategy than what was pre-COVID. I think that's the biggest difference between hotels in Belgrade before and now, and I hope this will remain because Belgrade deserves um, to grow I, 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 in terms of ADR. And when I look at the owners, I think that we, we here in Belgrade have so many international chains, mostly franchised, uh, but there are also some managed hotels. Uh, there is obviously Ritz Carlton coming uh, to Belgrade. And, and, you know, I think when you look at what Marriott has done, what Accor has done, what IAG has done, and many others, you see not only growth in Belgrade, but now you have Hyatt in Novi Sad that was signed, few hotels we were talking in, in the other secondary part of the cities. I think in that type of the market, we do better job than, than Croatia. I like comparing ourselves with Croatia because Croatia is part of European Union. Uh, it's not anymore Schengen, it's a European Union, and it's a huge advantage for, for the hotel business. Um, but when you look at um, Rovin and, and what, for example, Maistra has done, and then you compare that with some other hotels in Croatia that, that are independent, for us international chains, Croatian market is kind of the most difficult to penetrate out of all of them. Um, and, and there are a few reasons for that. But I think, but I think whoever, uh, whoever opens a good brand in Zagreb, uh, a luxury brand in Zagreb, will kind of start the era that will happen what used to happen in Belgrade 10 years ago. Maybe I'm wrong, but I checked before that IG doesn't have any presence in Croatia yet. How? No, we don't. And, and you know, we worked so hard and, and we were never able to, to create a deal. We had, uh, th there is one big reason though. Uh, we don't want to start with a hotel in Trkvenica. We, <laughs> we, 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 you know, we have yeah, offers, we, offers, we have offers for, especially for the seaside. There are deals coming all the time. But you know, development life, it's like you, know, you get PKF or Colliers or all these guys, and then they invite all of us, and then you bid and you send offers. I think it's important for people to know. And then this guy says 4% a year, and then he says, no, we'll do 375. But the point of, of, the point of, of really development uh, would be if we can get our foot into Zagreb. Um, we are not interested in going to other parts of Croatia until we open Zagreb. And for some reason, um, so far we're losing that battle. Um, but we're going to continue fighting and hopefully we'll do the same what we've done in Ljubljana, in Tirana, in Belgrade, we'll be able to do in Zagreb. Yeah, of course, please. Albania. Don't take me wrong, Zivar. I think Albania is the next big thing, but not ready at the moment. Adding a brand to an existing operational hotel, it makes sense. At the moment, it's a smart move from an owner in Albania because it increases visibility, it puts you in a pool of loyalty scheme, which is huge uh, compared to a local operator, and also gives you the knowledge and the tools to overcome any difficulties that might arise in this coming season. But most of the projects in Albania right now are greenfield projects. So at least from my side, most of the funds I'm talking to are looking at for value-added properties, so already operational hotels, all hotels that need the least refurbishment, so they can be operational in, let's say, one year. Then they need to operate and stabilize operation for the next three, four years, and then sell the property at a multiple of the EBITDA. So projects in Albania, Greenfield projects in Albania, they're not very attractive to them right now. So it will come, according to me, but first of all, you need Albanian investors to start putting their own money so they can show trust on the project, so they can convince external investors that there's something going on there, the government will support, the local investors will support. So it will happen, but not very soon. For me, Greece, Romania, Croatia are the places to invest at the moment. I think you brought um, one, one thing that I wanted to also briefly discuss and then we can open the questions to the audience. So you said that a lot of owners, investors are looking to quickly turn around. Um, We've seen that in the last few years, there are a lot more uh, collections being created, like a soft brands vignette collection for IG, um, registry, tapestry, <laughs> all the other collections. What, what's, 
your view on that approach, on this soft branding? Does this give you some um, security or is it just for the owners to quickly get in and out? It's becoming more, more and more of a trend uh, and all the brands are introducing more of the soft. The problem that soft brands solve is that you can keep your own identity. So, especially in Greece, like, the owners are very stubborn. They think that the product they have created is the best product they can have. So they don't really like comments from an American brand saying what to do, what to build, and how to operate easily. Uh, the soft brand has have this flexibility to keep your own identity, to be local, but at the same time being part of a bigger team, bigger family that can help you in difficult times. And it was difficult in the last couple of years because market was booming. So talking to an owner about an international brand was very difficult and convincing why he needs you. But nowadays and the years to come, it's going to be much easier. I think that's where we're moving. Most of the owners and operators will turn to brands, either hard or soft. Uh, from our side, we push a lot the uh, soft brand. We have trademark collection plus the registry collection, which is a luxury product that we recently opened one in Greece, in Halkidiki. We believe that. But uh, at the same time, we push a lot all our brands, and especially the hard ones. Uh, maybe I know that we have around 10 minutes left. So anyone in the audience, do you have, or anyone online? I didn't forget you. I know you are there. We have some virtual um, attendees as well. Any questions? It's a conversation. Just feel free to. Any comments, maybe? Feel like sharing your own views? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned you can uh, just maybe just uh, let us know introduce yourself and yeah, then yeah, sure, sure. I, mean, I, know, uh, I know you but Dennis Rofts of uh, Tenet Advisors. Um, so you mentioned in the start of uh, this uh, section that uh, Belgrade is ahead of the curve uh, in terms of recovery post-COVID and probably part of it uh, is uh, due to its uh, situation as kind of crossroads uh, now in this conflict time. Hopefully this will end uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, do you think that uh, there are some other like more fundamental, more long-term uh, factors that uh, will also continue keeping uh, Belgrade in front. I can comment from my side, but then again, um, if Mr. Vasic wants to comment from his perspective, um, I think there are various factors influencing Belgrade. One, uh, in terms of, it's also important to look at the base, at what level was, because we are looking at the uh, growth comparing to 2019 and recovery versus where the destination was in 2019. So. Definitely the big impact of Belgrade uh, recovery and growth is the political economical situation which brought a whole new segment. Uh, but I would say the connectivity has been improved, the hotel offering has been significantly improved in different, different aspects. And um, if you look at the airport, it's expanding. There are more flights coming to Belgrade. I come to Belgrade with visa flight. For personal reasons, I get to come four times in the last uh, three weeks. Every time flight was packed and the plane has been doubled, they increased the aircraft. So there is, I think there is a sustained, there is definitely a sustained dem demand for Belgrade, but it's really on the hotels how to manage that demand and how to maintain, how to maintain the pricing. And what's also interesting, what uh, Jivorad also mentioned, we will have the first really luxury property opening that will drive some new demand that maybe didn't have Belgrade on the radar before, but there has to be um, content to support arrival of this different maybe type of visitors and destination has to put effort in keeping maybe those people longer or giving them enough to to keep them. Um, and one one uh, aspect for Belgrade also, we know that there are a number of sports events here. So every time when there is sport event, this year we had a big, big uh, spike during uh, um, Real Madrid parties and games where the hotels really. So whenever there is an, uh, an event in the city and the events are coming back to some extent. Um, so I don't know if um, Givorod, who is in the market, maybe would add something on, on yeah, I, I think, um, I, I mean, we, sp we spoke about the airport, but, you know, I think the, the, the key to Belgrade is how this market used to function is 
we would be sold out on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And Tuesday, Wednesday were always the, the two best days for, for the hotels in the city. And then, and, then, and then Thursday would kind of start slowing down and then we go into the weekend and the hotels would remain uh, relatively unoccupied. Um, and we used to talk about the clubs and the restaurants and the nightlife and how this is fantastic. But you know, it takes time. And then when the COVID hit and, and did the reset, um, people actually decided that they want to live uh, a bit different. They want to enjoy themselves a bit different. They want to come and visit something they haven't. And all of these things that we were talking about, the Belgrade, very shy, um, started producing. The second thing that started producing, and I know that uh, there, there is actually an actual number that talks about that, but we started having more and more smaller international conferences. Uh, so we, we learned, I saw Igor somewhere, uh, he, he, that, that guy in the white shirt there, about uh, 12 years ago, used to be a leader for the King Congress Bureau of Serbia. Uh, and he actually taught all these people how you bid for something. And, and we were having old convention center. And now there is a convention center that obviously is being renovated and that will open <clears throat> recently. I think that will help Belgrade also grow. I think the biggest difficulty for, for hotels in Belgrade would be to maintain their capex and to invest so they can keep up with uh, much higher rates that are coming. Uh, we have quite a lot of hotels now that needs uh, more than just soft renovation. Uh, and if you look into them, we're in one of them. Um, I actually came to Metropole before I came here because I thought that the, the, the Rebec was there. I didn't read. Uh, I mean, I was used to it for, for past years. And I walk into the lobby. There are so many things you see there that needs to be changed. Um, same thing if you walk into any other hotel. So, so in order for us to maintain this rate that will continue growing, uh, we'll have to use and spend some money. But I think Belgrade will continue having ADR that will uh, be quite impressive and that will by 2025 reach uh, the ADR of, of Ljubljana and some other cities uh, in Europe. And, and I think that's a great thing. I think already May year, May year to date, I didn't show the actuals, but uh, looking at this year, Belgrade was, and I've been following Belgrade data for a while, it was at around 109 euros um, on average, and it was ahead Ljubljana and Zagreb. Uh, the occupancy is still around 60%, but I think what we've seen in the last few years, it's it's going in the good good direction, I would say. And I think, our, of course, when we look at data, once property, once St. Ridge is open, of course, it's going to be a different, um, different average, so it's something to keep in mind because the whole city will um, go up. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you for your questions. No? Perfect. So we have a few minutes to, to wrap up. Maybe some last thought. And for me, if you had just a question, if you had um, money to invest, we looked at some specific uh, hot, hotel assets that outperformed. So would you invest, put your money in resort, in a secondary city? or in Gateway City, maybe for you, Sandra? Yeah, well, actually, um, before uh, COVID, uh, we used to be a um, corporate hotel company. Our hotels, it used to be in the CBD areas. So that th is a thing that uh, it changed a lot in all the um, hotel managers, hotel owners, hotel chains, uh, companies that people now want like open air uh, areas and this kind of, uh, uh, different things that they are looking for and they expect from the hotels to relax and so that's the reason um, now we are planning to invest more in uh, leisure destinations than in a city uh, still of course like big cities are Belgrade uh, is in our target but uh, yeah I think uh, destinations like Montenegro, Albania, uh, Croatia that has a very big uh, beach destinations is now our potential target uh, it changed after COVID, of course, like everything in life. Um, and yeah, also, uh, Nicola was uh, 
talking about the investors, I agree totally that uh, we need more local investors because it's not easy from a, a Sp Spanish investor to say, okay, let's buy a hotel in, in Belgrade uh, with only one feasibility study or, so yeah, I totally agree on that. Only wanted to say that point. Something that uh, we, we didn't maybe talk about because there is never enough time, but I was reading in the last few days how the all-inclusive is now becoming luxury as well. It wasn't, it was never considered as a luxury. So are the hotels that you're stars, are they all-inclusive concept that you're looking at or they're just a norm? No, actually we can consider um, like a full bar, but not uh, all-inclusive, yeah, like other Spanish, uh, yeah. yeah. Because all-inclusive was always perceived as uh, more of a mass, uh, yes. not that much sophisticated luxury, but there is um, luxury coming in all-inclusive as well. From our side, I already said the areas that will invest. Uh, ask Nicholas, because Wyndham is not investing, it's just a franchisor. <laughs> now, as a product, I will go back to something that Zivodar said at the beginning. I really believe in uh, branded residences. I think it's the future of hospitality and something that came here to stay in Wyndham in all of our major brands right now, we create an arm for residences. Uh, and in my region, one of the three pro uh, projects we're discussing, it's either a residences project, brand residences project, or a mixed use project, both a hotel and a residence. This, I think we have to leave the focus of the hospitality into the bed. Bed is not the central piece of every hospitality room anymore. I think every room has to be somewhere that you can work, stay, experience. So the communal areas of the residences are the future of hospitality. So that's where I will invest uh, at the moment. Going back just to close with a positive note, we keep saying all this time about the inflation risk, China slowing down, uh, the war in Ukraine, and uh, that investors are on a standstill right now waiting to see what's gonna happen. Uh, we have to remember that Every time, everywhere there's blood, there's always opportunities. So I believe that pretty soon we're going to have many deals coming in, even in areas that are uh, saturated like Greece right now. You're going to have many owners that uh, the need to restructure their finance will put them on the market. They have to sell the properties. Uh, also, many developers, due to the lack of finance in the coming months, they might abandon some, some of the projects. So there will be projects in the market. Also, at certain cities and countries, at the moment, the prices have skyrocketed and totally irrational. This will change. They will be rationalized. So because there's so much ammunition and dry powder, as you said, on the sideline waiting to invest, I think pretty soon the bid offer spread will narrow down and we're going to have many deals in the market. And we started with uh, Jivarat. Let's f finish with you as well. Any final um, remarks from you? Even uh, uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop here because I know we're running over the time. I'll let Nicolas' words be the last one. It's uh, difficult. It's easy to play with other people's money. You know, I always say that. Now that I'm investing myself quite a lot, uh, I learned that. I think the quicker we all learn that, it will be easier. So. Thank you for the panel and thanks for uh, managing all of us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to panelists. Uh, I think to, to summarize, we are ending it on a really positive note. There is a lot of potential in the region. There is a lot of opportunity in, in crisis. The crisis is passing, hopefully. So uh, I'm looking forward next to next year to see how will, um, how will everything develop. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.